I'm really buoyed by the government support and you know the, the trips I've had to Ottawa and again mm -hmm. as I said over to Berlin etc it's not just the ministers who who are talking the talk we're actually seeing the the bureaucracy underneath um, also walking the walk and when I say that they're actually being proactive in talking to us um, working through potential issues that we have around uh, permitting and funding etc and wanting to know what um, you know what our potential solutions are so they can work mm -hmm. through it that's at the federal level provincially we've got a, you know we've got a great relationship with the provincial government as well um, you know we're we're on a, a list of 17 critical mineral companies the only yep. rare earth company here that gives us a concierge service within within VC which uh, which means that if we do have issues within with any government department, we can go through the concierge service and, and try and fast track things that we need to do. You know, we've been commenting over the last while how all of a sudden rare earth minerals, you know, uh, all of the things around critical metals have all of a sudden come to the forefront. I mean, our old friend Jim Dines used to talk about that, you know, 15 years ago. But all of a sudden, our politicians are also on board. That's why I'm so pleased to get a chance to talk to someone right in the industry. Defense Metal CEO President Mark Torrey is with me. Mark, appreciate you taking the time. As I say, uh, you look at the last two years, I'm saying the political environment's changed, you know, recognizing what you guys have been doing for well over a decade, you know, saying, hey, wait a minute, this is important. No, absolutely, and thanks, Michael. It's it's a pleasure to be here. Um, oh, absolutely, and and I think what people don't understand is that you know rare earths cover a lot of different elements. So there's 17 different elements that are that are in the group that uh, mm -hmm. that are basically used in in everyday life. You know, from agriculture, healthcare, you know, through to automotive power generation, and particularly as as you you know you'll mention in defence, robotics, etc. So um, you know the there's a lot of uses in relation to, to rare earths in general, but I think what we need to really, you know, hone in on is what where it's used mostly in relation to uh, the magnetic industry. Mm -hmm. So um, we talk about basically four of those different elements that are used in the magnet industry and permanent magnets, which is uh, neodymium, praseodymium, uh, dysprosium, and terbium. And those permanent magnets are used in, you know, electric vehicles, hybrids, wind turbines, you know, defence, robotics, etc. And that that's the majority of the market in relation to to rare earths at the moment. Well, with the defence metals, you're in British Columbia. I was about 80 miles uh, from Kitimat, you know, major uh, from Prince George. Prince yeah. George, meant, yeah, major <laughs> in there. Um, I've worked up in both, by the way, uh, <laughs> major, uh, the whole area, but you guys are, are there. Have you noticed a change in investor attitudes towards you? It might be in institutional or, you know, just simply more interest shown by individual investors, because you just mentioned it's finally dawning on people, at least my, that's my adjective, finally, uh, you know, the incredible extensive use of these that we can't live without, I guess, is what's now coming home uh, true to people. No, absolutely. Um you know, it'd be lovely to still get more uh, investor <laughs> investor uh, interest, to be mm -hmm. honest. Because um, I mean, where we're sitting at the moment, I mean, we're competing with gold and copper, right? Which are, which are a great gone, point. Yeah, gone on all these runs, um, you know, in relation to their pricing and and so when you're talking to institutions, etc., there's still um, there's still people that don't really understand the rare earth industry. Um, and if they've got to make a choice between gold and copper, they're, they're sort of going to more towards gold or copper. Um, but we're seeing that that really change, I think, uh, over the last two to three months in particular. Um, more people are wanting to understand the rare earth industry and wanting to know who the real players are in the industry. And, you know, that, that's difficult because there's a lot of people out there that, that talk the talk. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, it's, uh, you know, you've got to really analyze and know what you're looking at in rare earths because it's complicated. Well, I would think I'll come back to that in just a second. I would think also the threat from China and the trade war, you know, they did withhold, you know, some of their exports. And I think people, again, don't appreciate to the degree uh, China dominates, not just in that sphere, but in the refined sphere too, which to me is great news for a company like Defense Metals. I mean, you know, because you're obviously in Canada, but but it has created an awareness. And I think even when I, I read stuff from the U.S. military, they realize they really can't open up extra 
uh, not that I want them to, but extra places, you know, to wage kinetic warfare because they, they literally have a problem with supply this way. Oh, absolutely. And look, I, I tip my hat off to China. They've had a long term strategic plan for, for well over 20 years now in relation to the rare earth industry and, and wanting to dominate that rare earth industry. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about rare earths, we're not talking about the mining and processing. We're talking about the whole downstream processing right through to, to the magnet manufacturing, which uh, goes into, as I said, the, the, the electric vehicles, wind turbines, um, yep. the defense, the aircraft, you know, ships, etc. So, you know, when we look at it, um, you know, China has over 90% of the downstream processing in relation to man magnet manufacturing. And I think this is where the Western world is really starting to wake up now. Um, and we see that with the um, the recent um, deal with uh, DOW and uh, and MP Materials mm -hmm. um, in relation to getting more magnet manufacturing facilities, and we're seeing it in Europe with some uh, some manu uh, magnet manufacturers opening up in Europe um, to try and to try and you know change that um, that wheel that we've got in there. And, and, and make the Western world have a lot more downstream processing in relation to magnet manufacturers, which then obviously means they need to be fed by someone, which is a great thing for, for Wichita and, and for defense metals. Well, let me come to your project. Uh, and again, when you look at it, I mean, we've heard, uh, you know, Pr uh, Prime Minister Carney talk about critical metals. They went to Germany and they were all over that. And, you know, they've talked about President Trump and Ukraine. You know, the list is there. The recognition starts coming. What's a realistic timeline, though? Yeah, look, I, I was there with uh, with with, uh, with Premier Carney over in in Germany. I got invited over there um, as part of that delegation. Um, so it was interesting. I mean, time timelines, you know, for for rare earths are not not quick. Like everyone wants you to be no. able to to produce something next year, but we obviously have to go through all the issues around um, doing a, a definitive feasibility study as well as permitting, and then obviously getting the funding. So I mean, a realistic timeline for us is 29.30 to looking at getting into production. Um, you know, as long as all the planets align and uh, you know we get we get everything we need in relation to funding, etc. Is it more receptive? Do you find? I mean, I'm as you can tell, I'm on that side that says government has not been an advocate in general. We, you know, I, I talked today about uh, petroleum. You know, for example, fossil fuels, and and yep. they have not been a proponent. They are talking in a positive way about your your industry. Um, do you find that though you have to have provincial support too, as well as federal support? You know, in our country, uh, I, I guess I'm asking for one of those, you know, Barbara Walters questions. Twenty five words. You know, uh, it's not so simple. I know, but just generally, you're finding the more supportive. I look, I'm really buoyed by the government support, and you know, the the trips I've had to Ottawa, and again, mm -hmm. as I said, over to Berlin, etc. It's not just the ministers who, who are talking the talk. We're actually seeing the, the bureaucracy underneath um, also walking the walk. And when I say that, they're actually being proactive in talking to us, um, working through potential issues that we have around um, permitting and funding, et cetera, and wanting to know what, um, you know what our potential solutions are so they can work mm -hmm. through it. That's at the federal level. Provincially, we've got a, you know we've got a great relationship with the provincial government as well. Um, you know we're we're on a, a list of 17 critical mineral companies, the only yep. rare earth company here. That gives us a concierge service within within BC, which uh, which means that if we do have issues within with any government department, we can go through the concierge service and and try and fast track things that we need to do. Let's finish with talking a little bit about what you guys at Defence Metals are doing specifically, you know, in British Columbia. Tell us about your project. Yep. So we finished a, a PFS study uh, in February this year, which was done by Hatch and SRK. Had some really robust economics come out of that. Mm -hmm. um, at the moment, we're running through some optimization studies from the flow sheet um, from from that PFS that will that will run into um, a bankable feasibility study that we're looking to to start in the first six months of next year. With, as you say, if things go right, it, it sounds like a very quick timeline to me. If things go right, you could be looking at 2030, you know, or the end of right. this decade. So, I mean, as I say, there's so much resting or riding on this, you know, as I say, you're in the all-star section right now of the resources. And I appreciate what you're saying. I mean, um, I've been big fans of gold in this show and 
be honest, quite correctly, but looking at something else, looking at federal government policies and, you know, uh, those kinds of things. But, you know, as I say, I had Jim Dines on years ago talking about the importance, talking about China's domination, talking about how we have to develop our own resources. So, I mean, I wish you all the best of luck. I think the country needs it. And I think it's a huge opportunity economically, too. Oh, absolutely. Look, I've been in the rare earth industry for over 10 years, resources mm -hmm. for over 30 years. So, so you know, I've been in gold, I've been in base metals. Um, you know, rare earths is a, is a fascinating industry. Uh, yeah. You know, I've spent a lot of time in China looking at the industry there, analysing different projects globally. And sort of I got a tap on the shoulder um, sort of September last year sitting in Perth um, saying, you know, would I be interested in taking this role? And when I did my DD in relation to the Wachita deposit and defence, mm -hmm. um, it was just something I couldn't refuse. It was just, it's just a world-class asset in my eyes. Right. And, you know, looking forward to, to moving forward with it uh, to get it into development. Well, I hope we get a chance to visit again in the near future. This is a, a, an incredibly evolving sphere with not a lot of choices in our country at this point. You know, I mean... Uh, I'm, I'm thrilled that we have a petroleum industry. I'm very optimistic going forward, but we've got a lot of choices there. We don't have a lot of choices in this sphere right now. So uh, best of luck for you guys at Defence Metals, and thank you for finding time. Uh, thank you, Michael. Yeah, it's been a pleasure.